thing in science, it's about classifying things. So it's how we know we've identified something new or if we've found something that has already been discovered or if we want to go out and we want to find a plant or something that can cure, say, a disease or be used for medicine, and we can find the properties, we can look up what people are already using it for by identifying it because of its characteristics. So we're going to look at first how we classify things, and then later in the term we'll look at things like food chains and food webs and ecosystems. I am sure you have studied ecosystems before in science and humanities, would that be correct? Yes, so like the barrier reef and rainforests and deserts and things like that. So we'll look at those really specifically. So the first thing I want to bring to your attention when we look at classification is we have an actual really clear system for doing this in biology. Okay, so all living things, first off, get classified into a kingdom into a kingdom. So that's very broad. All plants, all plants fall into the plant kingdom. All animals fall into the animal kingdom. So that's really, really broad and not super specific. It's basically just saying you're a plant, you're an animal, and you're bacteria, and it's very, very broad. That's the first step. So there's five kingdoms. So the five kingdoms are animals, so just like this toucan would be grouped into animals, so would you, so would that ant outside, so would the ibis out there. All of those are just classified into the kingdom of animals. Then we have the kingdom of plants. Again, it's all plants. This succulent, that eucalyptus tree, that palm tree, all just classified together into plants. Just all in general plants. We then have fungi. Don't worry, I'll crack out my fungi jokes later in the term. Um, there's plenty of those around. So fungi is all sort of your mushrooms. Really important in ecosystems. Does anyone know what's a really important role organisms like mushrooms play in an ecosystem? Have any of you learned about this before? So these, these organisms are really good at taking decomposing things and changing that energy into something really useful for them. So dead leaves, um, dead insects, things like that. So fungi, really important in ecosystems. The next one is protists. Protists, this is a microscopic picture. So usually protists are single-celled organisms. So your body is made up of billions of cells. Skin cells, hair cells, um, nail cells, uh, liver cells, blood cells. You've got heaps of bacteria in your intestines, but they're all different cells, whereas protists are little unicellular, so single cell things on their own. Really abundant though in the world. And then you have Monera. Now Monera are bacteria. So bacteria, are very, very abundant as well, okay? So bacteria, very abundant in ecosystems, very important in ecosystems. An interesting one here, it's been an argument with scientists for quite a long time, viruses, we've all heard of viruses, yes? Okay, viruses are not classified as a living thing. So there is no kingdom for viruses even though some biologists can theorise that they're probably one of the most abundant things on earth, if not the most abundant thing, we don't consider them living. Now that's one of the things we're going to look at in this unit of work, is what do we consider a living thing? All right, This floor, this concrete, was never a living thing. It was non-living. The wooden top of your desk though, is that technically a dead tree? Yeah, it's different, okay? And then we're living things. So we actually can classify things um, into those groupings as well. But we will learn about how we actually decide if something is living or not. Um, we'll start to get really specific. So invertebrates, what does it mean to be an invertebrate? I'll give you a hint. You are a vertebrate. You are not an invertebrate. If you were an invertebrate, you'd be a blob on the floor. 
So what do you think being invertebrate means? Look at the picture I've got there. Grasshopper. Oh, insects are invertebrates. So are crabs. They don't have a backbone. So invertebrates, it's very quick Googling there, Eli. Um, so invertebrates are animals that do not have a skeleton inside their body. Now there's actually different types though too, because technically a grasshopper has what's called an exoskeleton. It's got a hard outer shell to protect its insides, but technically it doesn't have bones inside its body. It's got an exoskeleton. Are there organisms that have no skeleton at all? So they're still invertebrates. So animals like jellyfish, no skeleton. Okay, a slug, no skeleton. So invertebrates means no bones inside their body. Whereas, <clears throat> oh sorry, and this is so there's a crab there, external skeleton. Jellyfish, no skeleton. Then we have monkey. Vertebrates, it's a baby gorilla. Um, vertebrates, so any animal that has bones inside its body. If you didn't have bones, like I said before, you'd be a blob on the floor. Bones will give us structure, okay? Your muscles and tendons, all that make you stand upright and move, but you require your bones to stand up the way you do. So animals with bones inside their body are referred to as vertebrates. Dogs, cats, birds. Oh, heaps and heaps of animals. Um, now, when we actually look at animals, we actually do classify them then into groups. We start to get more and more specific. So instead, instead of just going now all animals, aves, if you would like to write that down, that's a good, it's probably a new word for most of you. Aves is the technical term for birds. Okay, so birds. Then we have reptiles. So an interesting thing with reptiles that we look at is we are considered warm-blooded, they are considered cold-blooded. That's also known as being endothermic and ectothermic. We'll talk a lot more about that. But their temperature is regulated by the environment. Whereas if you are cold, you will shiver. If you are hot, you will sweat. Your body's very good at self-regulating. Even though sometimes you'll feel really hot, you might go red which is your blood vessels opening to try and cool your blood. You sweat and then it cools on your skin. Um, if you're really, really cold, when you get goosebumps, it's your um, the pores closing up to stop air, making like an insulated layer. So that's why your hairs will stand up. You're really good at self-regulating, whereas animals like lizards, crocodiles, they self-regulate by going in the sun or into the shade. Okay, they can't just do it inside their body. They are, it sort of, they require the environment to do it. We then have two different types of fish. I don't know if you're aware of this. So we have two types of fish. I'm just being really broad. We're going to spend weeks looking at all of this. Sharks, okay, they're what's known as cartilaginous fish. Do you have cartilage in your body? Yes. Yeah, so your nose is cartilage. Your ears are cartilage, okay? Now, these fish, their bones, they're cartilaginous, so it's cartilage, softer. Whereas then you can have a lot of reef fish, particularly, these are called bony fish. They have bones, just like we do. So there you go, two types of fish, cartilaginous fish and bony fish. Boys. Thank you. Um, and then you have actually one, some of these. These are considered some of the first types of fish. These are called jawless fish. So they don't have a normal jaw-like structure that you'd think of. So jawless fish. Um, I think these are uh, maybe what's called lamprey. All right, so jawless fish. A bit weird. Then we have what we're part of, we are mammals. Mammals have very certain, very definite traits that we use them to identify. They give birth to live young, they give their offspring milk. As an interesting side note, humans, which are mammals, we are the only organism that drinks milk in adulthood. 
No other organism drinks milk when they get to be adults, but we do. Um, and they'll have hair on their bodies. But there's some really interesting types of mammals and Australia has them all. Right, so we're a mammal. Dogs, cats, mammals. Now, so you've got cute puppies. These are called, called placental mammals, grown inside their mother, inside a placenta, and then the mother gives birth to them. That is what we are. We are placental mammals. Then you have, though, some really cool different mammals, and we will spend quite a few lessons looking at these. So we have marsupials. So marsupials, like the kangaroo, they are still a mammal because they feed their baby milk, they give birth to live young, but the major difference with marsupials in particular is they have a pouch and it's because they give birth to their babies really early. So whereas you stay inside growing and come out at nine months and you're quite developed, whereas marsupials are the ones where you often see the little videos and they look like a little tiny jelly bean, the baby. So they're born really early in their development and what they do is they then crawl into the mother's pouch usually attached to one of her nipples, and they will grow there. They will get nutrients and grow. And they will take a long time before they're out of the pouch jumping around. Because they need to be protected. If you're very small and you're out in nature, the chance of you being killed is very high. So the pouch is one of the major ways that marsupials protect their babies. Okay, so marsupials. Another one that I really love, these are called monotremes. Now, even though they're a mammal, does anyone know what they do differently than all other mammals? Compared to all other mammals, so echidnas, platypus, they actually do lay eggs. Now, they're not the same as like a chicken egg. They're quite hard, leathery eggs. They're still considered mammals because they feed their babies milk um, and, and, and sort of there's other characteristics with the hair and different things but they are the only mammals that lay eggs. So, major difference there. Still considered a mammal though. Trees. Um, trees. Animals would not exist without plants. So when we learn about food chains and food webs, plants are called producers. If you write one thing down about plants today, make it that. We call plants producers. Why they're so important to our ecosystems, I can't take you, sit you outside in the sun, and you just grow. You need to eat food. Whereas plants are called producers because they can produce their own food by simply being outside and in air. Because plants do photosynthesis. Take out of the air the carbon dioxide, Okay, they need some water. Both of those are just chemicals. They have sunlight for energy, and they actually then turn it into oxygen and sugar in their leaves that we then go and eat. So they actually produce their own food. They take carbon dioxide and, um, and water, and they turn it into sugar. All right, so they can produce their own food. You cannot do that. I, as, for as long as I can stick you out in the sun, you are not going to start producing your own food. Right, so really interesting in terms of chemistry, but important for the survival of all ecosystems. Plants are really, really important. So when we look at plants, we have different types. So we will look at bryophytes. So bryophytes are your mosses and things called liver, liverworts. You have pteridophytes, so a bit of a funny looking word, but forget the P's there, pteridophytes, so ferns. We also have gymnosperms, so gymnosperms have usually like pine cones, conifers, and gymnosperms mean they release seeds, okay? Um, and you have angiosperms, flowering plants. What's inside these flowering plants that insects like, birds like, pollen, okay? So angiosperms, plants, especially flowering, flowering plants, can actually do sexual reproduction. So they take the pollen between different plants to fertilize. 
So flowering plants. Um, I'm going to give you some time in a minute. I've got a couple of videos for you to watch. So particularly this one here is really good about the most successful species on earth. So in terms of size and abundance. What I do want you to spend some time doing today is going on this site here, which is about taxonomy. Taxonomy is one of the first things that we're going to study. This is the actual science of classifying things. You can go on to become a taxonomist. You can be someone that works in the Australian um, bush or in the Brazilian, in the Amazon jungle, and you can go and identify new species. And you are doing, you are what's called a taxonomist. You are identifying species and you are giving them new scientific names and you are using special techniques that we're going to learn about to say this is the first time this insect or this plant has been seen or found. You would be surprised at how many species are still getting dis discovered every year. You have the opportunity to still go out and discover a new organism. Right, that's a possibility. I want you to go on this site though and just take some time having a look around. So it talks to you about what is taxonomy. This is particularly about Australia and it's got things here. What's that? What type of octopus? Blue ringed, Blue -ringed octopus. Um, if you were a taxonomist, often your job would include being working at say a natural history museum or a museum where you actually have cases of organisms or things that people find and bring in and you classify them. So you classify them into groups and, so you, and we also look at plants. But I do want you to take some time just actually exploring this website. I don't need you to write a heap of notes, just actually have a look around at it. It's done by the Australian Academy of Science, so really reputable information. And then this is the last sort of activity for you to have a look at today. Watch the video and read the information below, and we'll watch the video together in a minute, on Carl Linnaeus. Now, Carl Linnaeus is really important for classification because we actually call it the Linnaean classification system. Do you think Carl's involvement was? He actually is the person that came up with the system that we still use now. So it's called the Linnaean classification system. He worked on it, he um, developed it, and that's what we still use. So we'll watch this video as a group in a minute. And then, like I said, I've got a couple more links to the website there where you can look at how we classify and the discovery of species. Like I said, people are still discovering species every day. And there's all different methods for doing that we'll look at. And then I just have a couple of questions for you to for you to do at the bottom of the page here, so when you scroll down.